Israelites have just started their wilderness journey for 38 more years, and a man is caught gathering wood on the Sabbath, an act which violates the Lord's command. Now Moses asks the Lord for his punishment, and the Lord tells him it's going to be death. So the people stone the man at the edge of the camp, and Moses gives the order to attach blue tassels to the corner of their garments to remind the people to obey the Lord's commands at all times and not to do what seems right in their own eyes. Makor is a Levite priest and he's very unhappy with the leadership of Moses. Moses calls for the Lord to have a tent of meeting with him and his leadership and Moses is astounded that they are not grateful because of their special positions in the tribe as priest. They are to bring their five pans, just as Moses and Aaron are to bring their pans. They all gather at the tent of meeting, and Moses warns all the people, Do not agree with these 250 priests and stand back. Korah, Dathan, and Abram are leading the revolt, and Moses warns the people that destruction is about to happen from the Lord and not his doing. So the ground opens up and swallows up all of them. Dathan and Abram and their families and the fire from heaven completely consumes all 250 priests leaving only their fire pans. Now Moses tells Eleazar to gather the fire pans and to hammer them out uh, as a brass plating for the altar so it will be a reminder to all of Israel for all generations to come. Well on the next day a large group complains about the death of Korah and the people and so at the tent of meeting Moses tells everyone to get back from this group too. He tells Aaron to fill his censer with incense to make an atonement for their sins. But it's too late. The plague has begun. Aaron stands between the dead and the living, and the plague stops. The plague kills 14,700 people. To teach the people a lesson, each tribe is to bring a rod with the name of their leader on it. Now, Levite's rod is to have the name of Aaron on it. Moses puts all the rod in the tent of meeting, and the Lord will choose the rod that he wants. Well, the next morning, Aaron's rod has budded. <laughs> it's sprouted out. It has blossoms. It's got ripe almonds on it. So Moses brings it out to show the people. Aaron is then instructed to place it before the testimony as a perpetual sign, and he tells them to put an end to all their grumbling, or they will die. Well, because of the Levite revolt, Moses and Aaron and all the Levites must bear the guilt of their corporate sin. So the Lord charges them to keep all the commandments and to do their duties and to serve and instruct. Now, no one but Levites will be allowed to enter the tabernacle. And if they come near, they will die. So the Lord gives all the best offerings to the priests and to their families. The firstborn of every womb, whether man or animal, must be be redeemed with five shekels of silver. However, the firstborn of an ox, a sheep, or a goat will not be redeemed because they are holy to the Lord. They will be offered as sacrifices and their blood will be sprinkled on the altar, but their meat will be given to the priest. As Levites, they will not own land as their own inheritance, but they will be given a tithe in return for their service. However, the priest must give a tithe to the Lord from the people's tithes. For meals, they will eat anywhere they wish, in any house or in any land. Now, the entire camp is to give Eleazar an unblemished red heifer, which had never had a yoke placed on it. Outside the camp, the heifer is to be slaughtered and burned in Eleazar's sight. So Eleazar is to sprinkle some of the blood towards the tent of meeting seven times. In the fire, Eleazar is to add cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet cloth. The ashes are gathered and deposited outside the camp in a clean place. If someone becomes unclean or touches a dead body, he is unclean for seven days. He is to wash on the third day and on the seventh day or he will not be clean. Open vessels are unclean, and so are bones. For purification, ashes are to be added to water, and it's poured into the vessel. The water is to be sprinkled on the unclean person on the third and the seventh day. He will then wash his clothes, and he will be clean. If the third day is skipped, the seven-day process starts all over. In the first month, Israel moves to the wilderness of Zin and camps at Kadesh. Miriam dies, and they bury her there. 
No water is available for the camp to drink, and the congregation complains to Moses. The Lord tells Moses to speak to the rock, and water will come forth. And in the midst of all the commotion, Moses strikes the rock instead. Well, it splits, and water comes forth. Later, the Lord tells Moses that he will not go into the promised land because he did not follow his instructions. Moses sends word to the king of Edom, their cousin, descendants of Esau, asking permission to cross his land on the king's highway, but the king of Edom refuses. From Kadesh, the camp moves to Mount Hor on the border of Edom. The Lord has Moses bring Aaron and Eleazar to Mount Hor. And on the mount, Moses takes the robe off of Aaron and places it on Eleazar, and Aaron dies. It is the first day of the fifth month of their 40th year of journey. Aaron dies because of the participation in the making of the gold calf and his sin there at Mirabah. And when the congregation hears of Aaron's death, they weep for 30 days. Now a Canaanite king hears that Israel is coming his way and he attempts to attack her and take her captive. Well, Israel vows to destroy all the Canaanite cities if the Lord will help them. And she destroys the Canaanite group and the cities in the area of Hormah. All Israel leaves Mount Hor, and the Lord leads her around Edom by way of the Red Sea. But people become impatient with God because the food is so miserable. So the Lord sends serpents to kill the people. They beg Moses to intercede, and he prays and he tells Moses to fashion a bronze serpent and place it up on a pole so that anyone who has been bitten can look up to that raised bronze serpent and live if he will believe. Well, from that mount, the Lord leads Israel to the camp in several different places. And they end up at Arnon, which is on the border between the Moabites and the Amorites. From Arnon, they continue to Beer, where the Lord gives them water. And they dig a well and they sing, Spring up, O well, within my soul. From Beer, they continue to camp at Matanah and Mahaleel and Bamoth, which is the valley of Moab, and on to the top of Pisgah. At Pisgah, Moses sends a messenger to Sion, the king of the Amorites, asking, Can we cross your land? Well, Sion refuses, and he gathers men, and he travels to Jahaz to fight Israel, but Israel defeats him, takes all his land, and the camp moves on to his land. All the Israelites come near Basham. Its king, Og, comes out to battle them. They battle, and the Israelites kill Og and his sons and take their land. The camp of Israel moves into the land of the Moabs and rests on the east side of the Jordan River just opposite Jericho. All of Moab is deathly afraid of Israel. Their king, Balak, confers with the elders of Midian and the two groups decide to send for Balaam who lives near the Jordan River. Now Balaam is a prophet of God known for blessing and cursing people and he probably is an Amorite but he's faithful to the Lord. The men from King Balak request Balaam to return with them, but Balaam wishes to speak to the Lord overnight. The Lord tells him not to go with them and not to curse Israel. The men return to King Balak, and he re reports that Balaam refuses, and Balak sends them back. Balaam stalls them again overnight. Again, the Lord speaks to Balaam, but this time he tells Balaam, I ah, go with them, but to speak what he tells him to say. Even if King Balak fills Balaam's house with silver and gold, Balaam has decided to speak only the words given to him by the Lord. Well, in the morning, Balaam saddles his donkey and heads to King Balak with two servants. The Lord wants to make sure Balaam's eyes are open. The angel of the Lord stands in front of them with his sword drawn. The donkey sees him and turns into a field. Balaam beats the donkey. The Lord stands in the path of the vineyard and the donkey turns off to a wall and he steps on Balaam's foot. Balaam beats the donkey again. The Lord stands in front of them where they have now nowhere to go and the donkey lies down under Balaam and Balaam again beats the donkey. Why have you beaten me these three times, the donkey says? Because you have made a mockery of me. If I had a sword, I would kill you, Balaam replies. And so the donkey says, you have ridden me all your life. Have I ever done that to you? No, Balaam replies. And then the Lord opens Balaam's eyes and he sees the angel. And the angel says, go with these men, but speak only what I tell you. 
Well, King Balak is upset because it takes Balaam so long to get there. And Balaam warns Balak that he is only there to speak God's words that God puts in his mouth. And Balak wants Balaam to curse Israel. Well, he builds seven altars and offers seven rams and bulls, but it will not entice Balaam to curse Israel. They move to a different mountain where Balak builds seven more altars and sacrificed seven rams and bulls, but Balaam will still not curse Israel. Balaam warns King Balak that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. God has told Balaam to bless Israel, and that is what he will do. Well, King Balak changes his mind and begs Balaam not to bless or curse Israel at all. He has Balak build seven more altars and sacrifices seven more rams and bulls. Then Balaam blesses Israel. King Balak is furious. Balaam replies that in the beginning of this, I told you that I would only speak the words that God has put in my mouth. And King Balak tells him to go on home. And Balaam agrees. But first... He curses King Balak and tells him how Israel is about to be used by God to overrun and take his possessions from his own country. Then Balaam goes on home. Israel has now moved to Shittim, where they are intermarrying with the daughters of Moab and sacrificing to their gods. Moses tells the judges of the tribes to kill the idolaters in the clan. Because of the deaths, an Israelite named Zimri brings a Midianite woman named Cosby to the door of the tent of meeting to weep. Phinehas sees them enter the tent. He takes a spear and he runs it through both of them at once. The Lord is pleased and he stops the deaths. Twenty-four thousand have died. The Lord is pleased with Phinehas because he is jealous for the Lord. The forty years are almost over, and the Lord calls for another census like the one taken 38 years before. This time there are 601,730 men, 20 years and older. The land is to be divided by lot according to the number of the families' names in each tribe. Some will receive more than the others when they conquer the promised land. The census of the Levites is different from that of the other tribes. The male Levites, which include all males older than one month, number 23,000. Moses and Eleazar count the men in this last census. Not one of them is counted in the first census by Moses and Aaron because all those have died in the wilderness except for Caleb and Joshua. Zelophehad dies and he leaves five daughters and no sons. Therefore, his name will not receive an inheritance of land when they cross the Jordan. The five girls come to Moses and they ask Moses and Eleazar for an inheritance and the Lord agrees. And so therefore the girls will receive a portion of the land that they would have received had it been their fathers. After that, the Lord sends Moses to Mount Abram where he allows him to see the promised land. On the mount, he tells Moses to appoint a successor. The Lord chooses Joshua and Eleazar commissions him in front of the people with Moses. With the selection of Joshua as the new leader, the Lord has Moses repeat the requirements of all the offerings, the continual burnt offering, the Sabbath day offering, the first day of the month offering, the Passover offerings, the offerings for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the seventh month offering, the seventh month and the tenth day offering, the seventh month and the fifteenth day offering, the seventh month and the sixteenth day offering, and on and on, all the way through to the free will, the votive offerings, the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the drink offerings, and the peace offerings. Moses repeats all those offerings so they will not be confused and they will know what the offerings are to be. He also reminds them of, that a vow of any kind is very serious in the eyes of the Lord, no matter how ridiculous it may seem. The Lord has Moses remind the people that vows must be kept. For the man, a vow is binding. For a woman, her husband may cancel her vow on the first day that he hears about it. If she is a widow or divorced, she is obligated to fulfill the vow. If her husband cancels it before his death or the divorce, she is free from her vow. 12,000 men are selected to fight and destroy the, all the Midianites, 1,000 from each tribe, and they're told to kill everyone and bring all the spoils back. They are successful, killing every male, including Balaam and the five kings of Midian. 
When they return, they bring all the spoils, including the women and the children. Moses is upset because they have disobeyed the command of the Lord. So he commands that all the male children and all the women who have been intimate with men to be killed. The virgins are not to be killed. And after the command is fulfilled, all the Israelite warriors and the spoils remain outside the camp for cleansing for seven days. The purification water is made and the ashes of the red heifer is used on the third and the seventh day. The spoils are enormous, and 20% of it is all given to the priest for their use as an offering. The remaining spoils equal 675,000 sheep, 72,000 cattle, 61,000 donkeys, and 32,000 humans. Half is given to the Levites, and the other half is divided among the 12,000 warriors. Now a census is taken, and they learn that not one warrior has been lost in that battle. Each man brings an offering of gold from the rings, the necklaces, the bracelets, the signets that they have taken from the dead Midianites. The value is 16,750 shekels. Now Reuben and Gad have the largest herds, and the land that they have just conquered is perfect for their purposes. They ask Moses for it. At first he refuses because... It will not be fair to the rest of the families who have not received their inheritance yet. But he changes his mind and tells them that he will give it to them if they will promise to cross over with them and help all the other tribes get their inheritance before they come back and settle. So they promise to do so and they set their families in these secure cities and then they go and fight with their brothers until they have all had their inheritance given to them. And Moses agrees. But he also gives the land to half the tribe of Manasseh. So the three tribes take the land, change the names of the cities, and they secure their families. With that, Moses recounts all the places that they have lived over the past 40 years. From leaving Egypt until they finally are there just opposite of the city of Jericho on the east side of the Jordan River in the plain of Moab. When the land is completely divided among the tribes, 48 cities will provide land for the Levites to live and to raise their crops and cattle. They do not own the land, it is on loan to them. Six of the cities will be cities of refuge where murderers can go and receive a fair trial. The verdict for those who flee to those cities of refuge will be based on the information of more than one witness. The Levites are given the land 1,000 cubics around the perimeter of each city from the city wall. And the other tribes will pasture the land that begins 2,000 cubics from the city walls. The daughters of all the tribes can marry outside of their specific tribe. However, their inheritance does not transfer to the new tribe. It remains with the original tribe. If a man only has daughters, they must marry someone within their own tribe or the land will not transfer. Such is the case of the five daughters of the man who had died and did not have an inheritance just two months remaining before the 40 years in the wilderness ends, Moses speaks to the people in three final messages intent on retelling the history of Israel and the law of the commandments that they must follow as they enter the promised land. They are in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophal, Laban, Hazioth, and Dizah Ahab. Moses reminds the people that from Mount Sinai, which is Horeb, it was just 11 days journey that took them 38 years before to Kadesh where they were to enter the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapters 1 through 4, Moses recalls the journey including the move to Moab and snippets of the important points that took place. In chapters 5 through 11 of Deuteronomy, Moses recalls the events of Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments and the Levitical law and he urges the people to be faithful to them throughout every generation. Additionally, he warns the people to serve no one but God. In chapters 12 through 26, Moses repeats the law governing Israel's worship and her community and her religious leaders and her social regulations and her loyalty to God. In chapters 27 and 28, Moses foretells the blessings of keeping the laws and the curses of breaking them. And finally, in Moses' third message, he summarizes all the laws and exhorts the people to be obedient when they cross into the promised land.